presentations. Um, we run these incubator sessions um, every winter, and we'll be running one again next year. Um, and the idea is really to do collaborative work um, that neither the project leads nor the data scientists can do independently. So this is bringing together people and, and trying to work on a project that is really can only be done together. So we have an application process that um, if you're interested in it, it the application calls usually go out in November. Um, and that might be a little earlier, but basically late fall next year you can watch the, the um, eScience email list. And then we take the um, applications and we match them, pair them with a, a data scientist um, who's interested in working on the project. Um, and that's actually the primary selection basis is that we have somebody who feels like they can, can help and, and, and work on the project. And then we spend 10 weeks, um, two, two full days a week working on these projects. And this is the, the, the culmination of that process. So um, we're very excited to see what, what, what people have come up with. And um, the first talk is going to be by Julian Alden. Um, let him Sweet. I know. Afternoon, everyone. Nice to be here. I'm excited to talk a little bit about 10 weeks of incredibly hard and frustrating work <laughs> coming together, uh, accumulating into this presentation. I want to th thank uh, Spencer Wood for making what I think is simple extremely hard. Um, <laughs> and Rachel, um, who's currently an undergrad and beginning joining my lab as a graduate student excitingly this fall. Um, to hopefully take a lot of this work to the next level. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we try to predict uh, the spread of invasive species across landscapes. So invasive species are things that move from uh, their native range to outside of their range. They typically do throw, throw through on the shoulders of humans, so they people move invasive species around. Um, recreational boating and angling is a major vector of aquatic invasive species. Um, one of the main reasons why they do that is that anglers come and fish in local water bodies with live bait. When they finish with that, when, when they finish fishing, they often release that live bait into a water body. Um, they also use fishing gear, which can entangle um, invasive species. Uh, spiny water fleas shown here. Aquatic weeds can entangle on motors, which then move from one water body to another. Um, and then they can actually attach to hulls like a shown zebra and quagga mussel here. So um, a lot of invasive species have moved around through these vectors. These are some notable poster child children, if you will, of aquatic invasives that have moved around. Typically, the way in which um, ecologists have tackled this issue is that we like to try to model or predict the spread of these individual species across the landscape which is quite interesting because uh, we'd hazard to say that's the wrong species to be modeling. The correct species to model is actually humans. They're the pathway in which they're moving multiple species around. So it might be a more economic and efficient way to try to predict the spread of aquatic invasive species. This is really important because uh, literally millions of dollars goes into the prevention of invasive species across the landscape because they have an estimated around $130 billion in damage every year to the US. This is done through educational um, signage shown like here in certain water bodies or cleaning stations in which boats and fishing gear is cleaned um, before going into a new water body. But with the US literally having uh, tens of millions of water bodies, it's very difficult to try to uh, target which body water you should actually invoke these educational opportunities uh, to try to prevent the spread. Traditional approaches to understand how boaters move around the landscape and therefore how they move invasive species is very limited in space, time, and representation. Typically, they involve these very boring uh, uh, um, interviews, if you will, at boat launches, with very, um, uh, which ask a very simple questions like, where have you fished over the last couple months? And this is then typically done in cost thousands and thousands of dollars just to get an idea for one water body. Late Wadcom is a really great example just to the north of here in which literally hundreds of thousands of dollars were used in these boater surveys just to understand where boaters were coming to for this one water body. So you can imagine that new approaches are needed to try to understand across all water bodies what is the risk of species getting moved around through boaters. It's also these are very limited in representation. They typically target 40 to 55 year olds and they're white males and whereas the youth and the demographics of fishing and boating activities is changing greatly. 
So this, these approaches really are not broadly representative of boaters and anglers across the landscape. So we are interested in saying, can we use mobile technologies to try to improve our understanding of angler and boater behavior that is movement across the landscape? The way in which we try to do this is through two main non-traditional approaches. One is to leverage this growing use of phishing mobile apps. The idea is a very, it's a multi-million dollar industry in which um, anglers buy phishing apps to basically record the types of fish that they're catching and where they're catching it. So they have advantages in which you have location and date of angling activities. It can either be active in which you actually say you caught a fish or it's passive in the case of the technology I'll be talking about in a second, where it's constantly sending locations of the angler. So you have these real great opportunities to have detailed user data among these anglers. The disadvantages is that their incomplete representation is only people who buy this technology or use it. Uh, retention is a really big deal. For example, the technology I'm gonna be showing you today, the business is up for sale. It might not continue in the future, nothing to do with us. Um, and data quality and biases also exist in terms of a lot of anglers don't like to represent where they are because they think they have the best fishing spot on the landscape. Social media is another growing source of data, and this is what was like, most excited to work with Spencer. Spencer's been a real pioneer in trying to understand how we can use geotagged uh, photographs with space and time to get an indication of outdoor recreational activity. Um, um, and, um, and it has some limited uh, data with respect to the users, but it has disadvantages as well, uncertainty repre uncertain representation in terms of the people who are actually using social media, changing platform popularity, um, and then again, there's data quality and biases. So in this talk, we're interested in using one piece of, uh, of a phishing app technology. This is called the iBobber. This is a bobber which is sense, uh, basically is a depth sounder, but it also pings to the sky every 50 seconds to give us the location of anglers across the landscape. And then we're particularly interested in using Flickr data, although it's a platform that's not used as much. Um, a whole variety of uh, studies done by Spencer and his colleagues shown that's a very strong indication of recreational use across the landscape. So we wanted to use these two um, applications to try to leverage and understand human movement between water bodies of the United States. So these are the records of iBobber users, people that are using this mobile fish app. So we have around um, 20,000 anglers or registered users. There's about 70,000 iBobber records shown in dots across the landscape over a two year period. And this relates to about 25,000 water bodies. Um, and this is the angler activity through time, which shows a lot of people are angling during the winter, uh, during the summer times, and then not so much during the winter times. So although this might look impressive, one thing that will come to mind is that we have 20,000 anglers and only 70,000 actual measurements. So really a lot of anglers are not super, a lot of iBobber users are not super active in terms of how they use this app. Um, but it is broadly representative of, of the angling activity. Each one of these dots is the state in the United States. This is iBobber activity as a percentage in an independent survey done by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So we have pretty strong relative representation of the number of anglers recorded by US Fish and Wildlife Service and what we have for iBobbers. So we have this general situation. We have a bunch of iBobber users across the landscape. We have a bunch of social media uh, geotagged photos across the landscape. What do we do with this? Well, first we overlaid all US water bodies across the landscape. This does not always correspond, obviously, to where those photographs or where those iBobbers use it. People like to test their iBobbers in their bathtub. People take selfies not always on lakes. So we can then filter out all those users in terms of where they occur on water bodies of the United States, shown here. Um, and then we removed, looked at only those lakes in which had the activity either of an iBobber or, or um, someone with Flickr data, which basically suggests that those are lakes which are used as recreation. We then calculated the shortest road distance between each one of these pairwise lakes and also collect, measured the amount of time between each one of these visits. So we had a source and a destination lake, if you will, for each one of these visits. We also started to look at things like occurrence of non-native species in these water bodies, but for the sake of time, I won't be able to talk about that today. So we can use this data in two ways. First, we can use this data to understand what is kind of the movement behavior of recreational boaters and anglers across the landscape. This is a histogram which just shows the distance, road distance travel between water bodies for different anglers according to iBobber and users according to Flickr. So we have around a th um, 
uh, we have around a th um, well you saw the anglers that we have um, um, and uh, users in general overall sorry we had about 90,000 visits between one water body to the next here I'm showing the results just for the Pacific Northwest not for the entire United States for the sake of time this is what the Flickr users are shown in blue the eye bobbers in red so you can see we have good geographic representation across the landscape and in general when we measure the distance moved about 50 percent of anglers move more no more than 33 kilometers between one water body to the next um, and interesting flicker actually matched up pretty well with that around 43 kilometers given that these are very different users not all flicker users are fishing right um, so what we did is that we basically looked at all pairwise dis uh, road distances between all lakes in the Pacific Northwest that had records in these data sets. And then we basically just connected those lakes which occurred less than 33 kilometers away from one another with the idea that the majority of anglers are likely to move that distance and therefore they're likely to move invasive species between those lakes. Um, so we did a quick um, a network analysis and this is the network shown here. There's around 353 water bodies in this network. Um, it's actually a fairly fragmented lands, uh, network shown here. So each one of these nodes is a lake. The node is proportional to centrality, so how connected it is to other lakes within the network. And you can see there's a number of water bodies in which don't get that much visitation between them. But then we have some kind of core components, if you hear. These are lakes that are all connected by that minimum distance. And therefore, an invasive species that like, might be in this one lake would have the potential to be spread to other lakes through very common uh, movement of humans. So we have this network has 50 components uh, shown here, and this is the number of water bodies in each component. So for example, the largest component uh, shown right here. But you can see there's lots of very fragmented components shown on the, out, the outside. So if we just zoom in to one of these components shown right here, I just want to kind of zoom in a little bit. So again, each one of these nodes is a lake. It's an arbitrary number in this case. But I show this component, I show these this one component because it occurs just north of Portland, straddling the Oregon and Washington border. And I just want to use this as an illustration of how we can use this to actually prioritize management. So for example, this lake right here, number 177, this is Vancouver Lake. Washington, just north of Portland, a very highly urbanized lake, receives a lot of traffic and actually has very high node centrality, which means it's very highly connected and shows the most edges in this network compared to other nodes. So this is a really, this is really a conduit, if you will, in terms of potentially facilitating the flow of invasive species via humans across the network. But then there's a whole, whole suite of other ways in which we can look at these networks. For example, Lake 183, shown right here, has a very high betweenness index, which basically means it serves as a bridge, if you will, between two subcomponents of a network. So you can see in this case, this lake is very important for connecting these lakes to the larger networks of lakes within this. So these lakes have different degrees of connectedness, if you will, or betweenness, and that means very different things in terms of the management um, and, and moving forward. But in all instances, this is where high amounts of education or boat cleaning might be a very effective way to kind of stem the spread of invasive species across the landscape. Um, so that those networks were based on just using the eye bobber and the Flickr data to understand what is the distribution of distances moved between water bodies and then we use that as a filter just on all lakes in the Pacific Northwest. So you might be saying okay that could well you might not be saying that's cool but a cooler thing is to actually use the actual water bodies that were moved between iBobber and Flickr data. So actually use the source and the destination lakes and that's what this network is right here. A very ugly network and a very very highly fragmented network. So in this case, it's the same thing. We have a lot more water bodies, but these are actually lakes that were visited within that two-year period um, based on iBobber and Flickr data. So one thing I want to show you is that there's a huge amount of components, highly fragmented and unresolved, although there is some stronger network of lakes um, shown in the, in the core here. Still a lot of work to be done here. Um, and that's what I want to talk about on my last slide is the next steps that we're going to be taking this. So what's really interesting is that there's really multiple lines of evidence of using this non-traditional data. There's a whole bunch of other phishing apps out there which have additional data that we're excited to tap into, obviously other sources of social media. But then there's also this untapped online phishing forms, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. 
Um, obviously, the Flickr data uh, was only filtered by location. Um, so it tells you nothing about whether or not those users were actually on the lake or fishing or on a boat. So obviously, you know, convolutional neural, neural networks, machine learning approaches all provide ways in which we can filter these images down to know that we're talking about smallmouth bass or talking about common carp. What's really interesting is that we, then we can also then filter those images according to actually images of, water, of uh, boats. And then this is online fishing forums in which anglers like to brag about the large fish in which they catch. They have images, and those images also is an untapped resource in terms of, again, understanding the movement across the landscape. So moving forward, we just hope to actually use these multiple lines of evidence to try to set up a more coherent story around the way in which um, people are recreating on lakes, moving between lakes, and how they might actually spread invasive species. Great, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, let's have Lauren start setting up, and it is in, people have questions for Julian in the last? Thanks, Julian. Um, curious, you mentioned that you looked at some of like data on like, which lakes have invasive species. Yeah, yeah. Kind of talk about that. Uh, I still don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, happen to get to the point where you might have been able to see if there's any agreement between the that you developed in any of your methods and where like an invasive species that has already spread um, right. to a bunch of water bodies to those. Yeah, um, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, so the challenge is, is that um, we have incomplete data on invasive species for so many lakes. So we have a big national wide data set, but the reality is that it's only a small fraction of lakes which we actually know what invasive species are there. But for the next step, what we want to do is basically, we can develop models to say the likelihood of different invasive species in a lake, and we can use that statistical model to basically say, where are lakes which likely have high or low of invasive species, to then filter it. I think it's a cool next thing to have. But yeah, so we'll be able to weight nodes according to whether or not they have invasive species and whether they actually get entrained on boats. Mm. Which I think would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. So next we have Lauren. I'll let you introduce your. Awesome. Um, so I've been working for the past 10 weeks with the help of Rob and Shiv here in Ear Science and then another postdoc, Brian Green, outside. Um, so I just want to start off by saying thank you to them because this project looking at precipitation and trying to understand how it interacts with circulation and energy transport in the atmosphere would not have been possible without them. Uh, specifically Shiv who saved me from writing terrible code that would probably take way too long to run many times. So thank you Shiv. <laughs> but when we talk about the climate system and the atmosphere and basically anything related to Earth, it's always really highly interconnected and complex systems. So if you think about energy, precipitation, and circulation, they're really connected to one another. And in the general sense, we can think about energy coming in from sunlight is setting broad scale circulation patterns. So you have more energy coming in at the equator than you have at the poles, and you result in this sort of overturning circulation that happens in the broad scheme of things, where you have air rising around the equator, getting transported toward the poles as it cools, sinking in the subtropics, um, and creating this full, complete circulation cell. And as part of that circulation, you can say, well, then circulation is setting where precipitation happens. Where you have instabilities in the atmosphere, you start to lift warm, moist air. As that air rises, it cools off, precipitation forms, cloud forms, and it falls out of the atmosphere. But at the same time, that precipitation itself is going to feed back on the system. So you can think when the precipitation is forming, what's happening is it's releasing latent heat back into the atmosphere, which is changing your overall energy budget. At the same time, the cloud itself is reflecting sunlight, which changes the energy as well, changing the stability of the atmosphere, and in turn, changing the circulation and the transport of energy around the atmosphere. And this broad sense is true when we think about sort of blurring our eyes and viewing the Earth as kind of a very pixelated view, but when we want to look at something in more detail, things are much more complicated. So if we think about, this video is going to be showing you monthly mean precipitation, and you can see patterns that are very distinct. It's different between hemispheres, you have a very strong what's called intertropical convergence zone, ITCZ, that runs across the Pacific and even the Atlantic. 
You can see the monsoon occurring in India in the summer. Things are very different zonally, and they also vary in time. So the question that we've really been trying to answer is, well, can we understand the regional structure in these precipitation patterns, and can we understand the variability? Um, and when it comes to sort of energy transport, one thing that really matters for precipitation itself is where rain is forming um, and how that sort of vertical profile of latent heat release looks like in the atmosphere. And in the broad sense, we generally think of there being two types of sort of rain systems, convective systems, where you have a lot of convergence in the lower layers, air rises up, and you rain it out. And then stratiform systems, systems as well, where you have more convergence in the middle layers of the atmosphere, um, and you're releasing latent, latent heat higher up. But these profiles are very distinct, and they actually, you can say that depending on the latent heat profile, that tells you how the atmosphere is going to respond. So we really want to understand, well, what are these latent heat profiles look like? And the canonical sense of two, the question is, well, is that just because that's the physics we understood? Or is that actually what's happening in the atmosphere? Are there more than two latent heat profiles? How do they vary in space and time? What does all that look like? So that's what we set out to do, is sort of figure out what the dominant modes of these profiles are in the atmosphere. How do they vary? And then ultimately to be able to answer questions using that about how is this interacting with broader scale circulations? How is this interacting with energy fluxes? And these types of questions are really important when you think about moving forward with climate change as we're changing some of the energy balance of the atmosphere, how might precipitation respond? And how are all these things interconnected? So the general methodology that we took is we started with um, satellite data, the TRIM satellite, which gives us measurements of rain rate, latent heat profiles, as well as geospatial information. And using that data, which gives you observations at points over time, tried to group it together into cohesive rain events to say all of these sort of observations are near each other, they're all probably part of one giant rainstorm. And then from the events, clustering them together and looking at the modes, sort of saying what are the latent heat profiles that are dominant and tend to pop out of this data set. And then looking at them spatially and over time and trying to understand more broadly what this tells us about Earth's atmosphere. So the TRIM satellite itself that we use, it has 16 years of observation. Um, and we we're using a product from Howes et al, which sort of remapped the SWAS and was trying to interpolate based off sort of the angle that it was observed at, where it was observed over um, in space and time. And to make this a little bit more tractable just to start and get the methodology nailed down to begin with, we we're only focusing in on the Central Pacific. And then using that data set, what we wanted to do was cluster by these rain events. Um, we used a DB scan algorithm, which basically is sort of asking how densely um, close together your observations are, and it uses a distance metric. So the only things we were clustering off of initially were where in space is this occurring and where in time is this occurring. And one of the challenges here is if I observe a rain event, say, in Seattle, that tells me that it was rainy at that point in time. But if I observe rain tomorrow, I don't necessarily want to say they're in the same cluster in Seattle. They could be totally different events, totally different atmospheric conditions causing it. So you have this question of how do you go from space and time and convert it into one giant distance metric? Um, so we use sort of a common frontal speed that you observe in the atmosphere of 30 kilometers per hour to try to overcome that. Um, and what you're seeing on the right here is a picture of in black and white, just sort of a cloud satellite observation. This isn't the TRIM satellite itself, it's a different one. And you see that it's cloudy in the Pacific here. Here's Hawaii, just for reference. The Pacific is kind of vast, so I chose something that you could have some location marker and not just ocean. Um, and about five hours after this cloud satellite picked up cloudiness here, the TRIM, data, trim satellite passed over and picked up some rain events. So you can see each individual color is a separate rain event as our algorithm sort of pick them out. Um, and it's broadly occurring where you have clouds. There is distinction because you do have this sort of time lag between them. But this sort of gave us confidence that we weren't doing crazy things with the data. Um, and just to give you a sense of sort of the size of this data set, just in the Central Pacific region, over the 16 years, we were looking at about 
on the order of 20,000 observations of rain events. And then using these events, we asked, okay, what are the latent heat piles? Mentioned 200,000? Yes. Thank you. That's <laughs> why it's on the slide. <laughs> um, using these events, we took the mean latent heat profile from every observation in an event, and then clustered again off of that to say what are the main modes within the latent heat profiles themselves. And to figure out for k-means how many clusters we wanted, um, we used a mixture of both trying to minimize the inner cluster variation as well as maximize the silhouette score, which is sort of a measure of how similar clusters or how similar observations are within a cluster and how dissimilar they are from other clusters. Um, and using that, we ended up with five different clusters. And we can look at where they occur spatially. This is an annual average of sort of how frequent these modes are occurring and where. So you can see a number of modes are really associated with that ITCZ I pointed out, that long line of precipitation that's occurring down here and up here. Um, and then cluster two, wasn't very frequent occurring, and when it was, it actually tends to be in places where you have subsidence, which is interesting. You do, it's hard to see up here, but you have a little bit of coloring up there. And then the last cluster is really all at sort of your jet zones and where you might have storm tracks occurring. So I kind of threw that one out and said that probably wasn't tropical rainfall, or it wasn't often happening in the tropics, it's more associated with storm tracks. But to give you a sense of like what we can now do with this information, I want to just zoom in and think about cluster four. Um, and if we look at this cluster four, how I would interpret it as a physicist is you have some pretty deep convection occurring here because you're getting latent release pretty high up in the atmosphere all the way down towards the bottom. So you probably have convergence up here, uplift, and precipitation is occurring throughout the entire column there. Um, and one thing to note when you have latent heat that's being released higher up in the atmosphere, it's actually easier for the atmosphere to communicate that signal broadly over the whole area. Um, so this is important when thinking about how the atmosphere responds. This signal would be picked up and carried far away. And here you can see, I'm plotting it, what's the seasonal variability of it? And you see it's strongly occurring with both the ITCZ. Here you can see it moving up and down as summer and winter occur. And you can also see sort of the South Pacific ver branch of that coming into play in January and February where it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere. And we can do something similar for the other clusters as well and start to get an understanding of how these are changing over time. And then we can also ask questions about, well, how does this vary if you change different forcings in the atmosphere. So ENSO is one of the biggest forcings that most people have heard of. I'm sure being in Seattle, you guys all are aware of it. Um, but we can ask during El Nino events versus La Nina events, how does sort of this type of precipitation vary where it's occurring? So you tend to see it's increasing. Um, this precipitation type is occurring more often, um, which during El Nino, what you expect, you tend to have shifting of deep convection towards the central Pacific at this time. Um, but curiously, in August and September, you do have some decreases in the ITCZ, which is interesting and probably requires more looking into exactly what's going on here. Some of it might be just the lack of sort of strong El Nino events in August and September, um, but definitely something to look into and dive deeper into. So this is really just the beginning of the analysis. Um, a lot of what I did during the incubator was nail down the methodology, figure out how to use Amazon Web Services, um, with Rob's help, figure out how not to have a lot of ghost clusters going. Um, but the next part is what's really the fun physical part and expanding this further. Um, and one of the things to do is just look more than the Central Pacific. Um, you can have really different sort of types of rainfall and different rainfall events when you think about the monsoons or sort of land ocean differences and try to say, well, how does that change the analysis and the answers you're getting? Um, diving deeper into how this actually li links with circulation anomalies, there's a number of ways you could do that by incorporating reanalysis data or even running idealized climate model simulations where you sort of parameterize these different profiles and ask, well, how does the broad scale circulation respond if all my rainfall is of this type or this other type? Um, and then finally, sort of theoretical things you can do is sort of ask, if I shift my energy, if I shift sort of where incoming radiation is, or if 
I sort of allow the historical orbital cycles um, to progress in time, can I have a better understanding then of how my rainfall is changing? Um, and that's sort of full cycle then of how changing energy links to all of it together. Um, and the last one is always what I love to do is sort of say, do climate models actually capture any of this? Um, so get a sense of if you were to do the same exact analysis on climate models, would you pull out the same modes or would they be pretty different? But a lot more work to be done. This is just the start. So thank you guys. Setting up. We have questions for Lauren. Sorry, is there a question? I had a question about your, your comment about orbital precession. Yeah. So this is about the satellite that you're using to measure the events. No. So this no. is about in Earth history. Um, Earth's orbit has a number of cycles to it. So it has eccentricity that changes over time. Uh, obliquity is changes in precession. And one of those signals that you see with precession is changing in sort of where precipitation occurs. And you have a greening of the Sahara. So you actually end up with sort of observations of like the Sahara Desert back 20,000 years ago was actually like really mm -hmm. uh, And while well, theory of how radiation is hitting Earth can explain the directionality, it can't explain the magnitude at which that precipitation shifted. Um, so questions like this could help us understand sort of why is precipitation shifting as much as it is. And what's the time scale for that roughly? Like I think the processional cycle is like 27,000 years, if I remember correctly. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, so my name is Kong Yu. Um, thanks to Jose, I can stand here trying to show you what we have done. Um, so yeah, for the past 10 weeks, it was uh, really fun to work with him and also in the weekly meeting that we can learn a lot from other groups as well. Uh, myself is uh, Econ PhD, so I don't know much about natural science, I'll say. Learn a lot. Um, my my Research project is about competition under rationing scenario. Um, beneficial competition under rationing by weighting. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we usually define rationing as when the quantity demanded is actually much larger than quantity supplied. And at the same time, the price is for some reason being fixed. When the price is fixed, um, then we cannot adjust the price so as to match the demand and supply. Uh, for that scenario, um, we first define what is a product. Product uh, needs to be uh, one, obtaining that item. Secondly, it has to be obtained in a timely manner. Because otherwise, um, there is actually much fewer occasions that we can see rationing. Like um, if I, uh, let's say I'm, I'm queuing up for food, um, as long as I can wait for, let's say, uh, one day, one week, or one month, uh, I get the food eventually, like one month later, then I'm still getting the food, right? In that case, quantity demand is still uh, satisfied by the quantity supplied, but it is not uh, helpful if you get the food like one month later. And so the product has to be obtained in a timely manner. Um, under rationing, we have a limited capacity, and also there is a every period we would have some storage cost. And so there will be no way that you can just uh, produce like infinite amount at the very beginning. And then eventually when people need it, I just give it to them. Um, however, in our particular scenario, uh, we allow actually if the suppliers would know in advance what, what are the quantities to produce, they can just produce a bit earlier so that um, the quantity supplied uh, can satisfy quantity demanded. Um, my son a little bit theoretical, but let's just talk about some real situation. For example, uh, if we have some public housing and the housing is cheap so everyone can just apply and wait for the um, housing. 
However, it is a rationing scenario because for those applicants, many of them might have to wait for months or even years, depending on which society are you in. Uh, about surgery in hospital, um, especially in public hospital, you are scheduled that you should have a surgery, but you will usually you won't get those surgery like that night, even though people has confirmed that you you need a certain surgery. Maybe again you need to wait for a month, um, maybe a few months. Uh, a more daily example would be delivery service. I want the food at noon, but like there are thousands of people want the food at noon. So you probably eventually will only get the food, let's say 12.30. In that case, there will be 30 minutes delay. That will be, again, a rationing situation. And in all this rationing situation in economics, the literature usually suggests people will just have some kind of bad competition. In what sense? In the sense that they will just spend resources trying to get the good. Um, first. For example, in the public housing, they might spend resources in faking your address. Or maybe I address, if my address is in some area that uh, um, people will look more into, or maybe if I have more children, then I will get the higher priority for public housing. They will, they will fake those conditions um, by spending resources. Um, for example, if you can queue up and get the good, people will just wake up earlier to queue up for the good. By waking up earlier, spending those time waiting in line, all those time would also be productive if, if you can do something else. And so all those resources, all those time spent will be wasted in a sense. And so that's kind of like the typical way literature would take it. However, I would like to suggest um, actually um, we can have beneficial competition, even under rationing, um, because um, Take food delivery as an example. People would compete for the food. However, if they compete in a way that they just make an order, like call in or use your app to order the food, like earlier than needed, then the restaurant would know the information earlier. When the restaurant know information earlier, he can eventually uh, prepare more food earlier. And the food that can be delivered on time will be more. That's basically my research question, what I want to um, use my food delivery data to discuss more on this. So this is the data I have. Basically, I bring it to Yisan Sinitil with this 30,000 plus observations in July to September 2015 uh, for a food delivery app company in Shanghai, China, which is basically just like Uber Eats. Okay? Um, people make orders on this app, and then they will get the food delivered. It has pretty rich uh, variables or features. Um, it has all the time logs. They all have the user ID. We have the rider ID, the one who delivered the food. Uh, but there's major problem because there are many key features that are missing. Although I have the rich information, for example, this is the restaurant address, and then restaurant telephone number, and even customer address. I put a shape over there so as to uh, reduce the privacy concern. Um, but the problem is, all I have is just this Chinese address. Um, so I don't have latitude, longitude, I don't know the distance, I don't even know the restaurant name. And so I bring this uh, to our group. And then what we get eventually is, we figure we better get those information from somewhere else um, using Map API. And the typical answer is going to be Google Map. The problem is, in China, Google Map is actually not very popular. It is actually less accurate compared to another map called Baidu Map. And that Baidu Map has um, kind of a special uh, restriction for getting those API requests. Um, eventually, we satisfy those restrictions, getting approval. And then we build a function that is quite handy that can make efficient API requests in Baidu. Through that, we get the latitude, we get the longitude, and also we have the distance uh, and also the travel time. And in addition, we also get some restaurant information uh, from, uh, for those restaurants. And this is all we get. Now, uh, before we only have Chinese address, here we can have a map plotting out the latitude and longitude, black dots representing those customers, uh, red dots representing the restaurant. And this basically map out Shanghai in China. Right, this is just. Um, 
to show you uh, what we get. So we have the delay, meaning the delay time. These are just other time split. For example, how much earlier did we order the food? How much time it takes for restaurant to prepare? How much time the delivery person need to take ride to deliver the food? The final term over there time is the traveling time required according to Baidu API. So um, I guess the only thing I want to show you in this complicated thing is here you can see it's quite correlated. And this is coming from Baidu, this is coming from my proprietary data. So it shows that the Baidu travel time actually helped us to um, map out uh, the riding time needed. And if we do a bit of descriptive, uh, you can see that whenever it's 12 or around 6 to 7 p.m., it's the time where we usually have the most delay over the day. And this is a histogram for how much time earlier, if we exclude the cooking time and exclude the ride time, um, people will still order pretty early, like 10 to 20 minutes earlier than they need to. And if we plot out the delay on the y-axis and then how many minutes earlier would you order on the x-axis, you realize that as people order the food minutes earlier, they will get a smaller delay. And then uh, with those added information, we can uh, do a bit of uh, OLS. Um, so we can just focus on this table, I'll say. Um, you can see that uh, the earlier the people make the order will reduce the delay uh, in general, in different, across different specification. I guess what I want to highlight is this rider income. This is basically the delivery fee. And as we give more delivery fee to the delivery person, the delay should be smaller. However, we will see that in many cases, and this is just one column, but for many regression we have tried, it always gives me positive. Meaning if I give a higher delivery fee, the person actually will delay my food further. Which is weird. It's mainly because we don't have better control of those uh, geographical distance or travel time. Once we have included them, for example, this is the Baidu distance. Once we include them, we eventually get those uh, get the negative sign as we desire, which should be the more intuitive one. Uh, the more delivery fee we give to the person, the delay is less. And so we have a simple regression on, on delay function. Um, the other concern might be when we just run OLS, the simple re regression, people might be concerned that the two groups we're comparing, the group that order delivery earlier or the group that order later, they're actually different groups. Okay, so to address this, we have tried two more methods. That will be the last thing I talk about. Like, so for example, this one is the uh, standard one if we use the continuous um, variable, how much, how many seconds earlier do I order the food, how will it delay my food? Or if I use dummy, if this guy is ordering 20 minutes earlier, how much earlier can I get the food? We try two methodologies to try to balance two groups. The first one is multivariate matching. This is basically um, for, in the treated group, the group that ordered food 20 minutes earlier. For each observation, we will try to find a corresponding observation in the control group. We will find one observation in the control group that matches the most to this uh, treated observation. And then eventually, let's say I have 1,000 treated observation and 3,000 control group. Then for 1,000 treated observation, I will, each of them I will select one untreated observation that is closest to my treated observation. So that will be 1,000 treated observation and then choose another 1,000 untreated observation. And then I compare them, the two group will be most similar and the estimate will show me a fair group comparison. And if we look at the estimate, it's still uh, negative several hundred. So this is basically what we expect. 
Uh, but this is basically subsetting the group, right? I have 3,000 control observation, but I only use 1,000 of them. The other way is we don't subset the group. We just reweight the observations in the control group. We first would estimate propensity score probability, how likely the untreated observation would be chosen to be treated. Using that probability, we can set a weight for each observation in the control group. So that let's say the 3,000 observations in the control group will all be used, except each of them will have a different rating now. And then use that uh, kind of transformed group compared to this treated group. So in this regression, this one is the original regression we have. After balancing using the propensity score matching, you can see that the coefficient doesn't change much. So we say that um, with these two methods, kind of confirm that uh, they are actually the same group. They are not that different. So in general, our delay regression is a fair comparison between those who order earlier and those who order later. And these are basically what we have done in the past 10 weeks. Going forward, uh, with all those being done, we can start talking about like instrument. In economics, we mostly, uh, in many cases, we will use some instrument. For example, ring four would be uh, affecting the supply side but not demand side. Rainfall gonna affect the delivery time, but it shouldn't affect when do you want to order the food. Um, so that will be something that we would use uh, to disentangle supply and demand side, because in economics, in many cases, demand supply move together. Uh, with those, we can ask some related policy question. What would be the optimal discount to induce someone to order earlier? Let's say when we click on Uber Eats, maybe at the corner of University Way and 42nd Street, if in this five minutes you make an order from a restaurant there, maybe you get $5 discount. Those information can be incorporated once we, can, we understand how this um, information is going to help reduce rationing situation. And that's basically it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Questions for Hongyu? Yes. How did you uh, decide, um, maybe I just missed it, you said something about a treatment group and mm -hmm. then like, people who were ordering earlier. How did you know that people were in fact ordering earlier and they wanted their food at the same time? I don't quite. So first, uh, I observe those time locks, so I know when does he place the order. They also need to specify when the food is being delivered. So, so they, they have a requested time to deliver, and so he's looking at that. Oh, you use the requested time. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what was the issue with the Baidu API? I'm just curious. And what was you said it was? Um, by the way, API, for some reason, they will require you to have some uh, mainland Chinese uh, identity card for like I didn't check for some reason it's so restricted. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Except that uh, when you see people from mainland China and you ask them oh if I want to check its address in Shanghai, they'll definitely suggest you to use by the because in mainland they don't, they can't even use Google Map. Like it's good. Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and first off, just a big thank you to the eScience Institute and to Valentina. This has been a really amazing opportunity for me. Um, as someone coming from the uh, very um, 
soft biological psychology background who is trying to get more into computational methods. This has really been a transformative experience, so just thank you. Um, and so today I'm gonna be talking about um, using ultrasonic vocalizations in animal models to try to understand negative outcomes of traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and uh, neuropathic pain. Um, and so my lab is at the VA in South Seattle, and then I'm also in the Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Department here at UW. Um, and then Ben Land is uh, another PI I've been collaborating with. He has a model of neuropathic pain, so that data set comes from him. And then Michael is an undergrad who has been working with me, um, who did a lot of the annotations um, for the data set. Thank you. Awesome. So first, just talking about kind of um, this growing international health concern. I think everyone is familiar, maybe especially in Seattle, with um, kind of sports-related traumatic brain injury and some of the negative outcomes. Um, we also see a lot of being at the VA, my research focus on veterans. Traumatic brain injury is a huge issue with the returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, including the PTSD. And then a lot of these things also come with um, chronic pain results. And so one of the, the big outcomes is um, an increase in various types of mental illness following some of these um, traumatic brain injury or um, events. And so just this is just to highlight that, you know, mental illness sometimes doesn't get talked about as much. It's, it's more of a silent um, disease or disorder sometimes that people call, but it's causing a huge amount of um, both lost output worldwide, um, bigger than things like cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, and disability um, also. So um, unlike something with maybe um, a shorter um, time span, a mental illness is something that you potentially are dealing with um, for your entire life. So how do we study this in animal models? Um, so one of the things that we can look at in animal models, you obviously can't ask a rat if they are depressed or if they are in pain, they don't answer you like that. Um, but we can look at effective state. And so this is looking at kind of a negative or positive valence or effective state. So negative being things like emotional pain, anxiety, um, positive is pleasure, relaxation, or if you look in a two-dimensional, um, you get high and low arousal and then negative and positive valence. Um, and so here, these are showing examples of how we are um, creating these um, disorders in the animals. So this is shown our blast tube that we have at the VA. Essentially, it uses compressed helium to create a pressure wave that will travel down and contact the animal, um, recreating this um, traumatic brain injury caused by the roadside bombs in the wars. Um, this is a sciatic nerve, an example of sciatic nerve ligation, which is will produce um, a chronic pain model in animals. And then one thing we can do is we can pair some of these different um, events with an environmental context and then come back and ask what the animals act like in that environmental context. So for example, I will pair one of these, either these horizontal or vertical stripes, that chamber, with them getting this blast exposure. And then a month, six months down the road, I come back, I put them in that chamber and, and see what they do. And I can tell you the animals that have had a, a blast paired, they will move less, they will defecate, they act like they're stressed or like a PTSD type of behavior. Um, so, Another way to look at this is by looking at ultrasonic vocalizations. Um, and so these are a way that is increasingly being appreciated by people in the, the rodent research of a way of the communicating. This was traditionally looked at in mating or um, kind of more of the pleasurable, effective type of states. Um, up here you can see um, this is looking at the mean frequency and then the number of vocalizations. And so animals that are mating, they have you know, really, really high numbers of these ultrasonic vocalizations. You can actually play a male's ultra, mating ultrasonic vocalization to a female, and the female will move towards that ultrasonic vocalization. Um, but this is showing that essentially when you get into more of the negative affect, things like isolation or restraint stress, you actually see a shift in the frequency of these vocalizations. And so it is that they are having different, different types of vocalizations meaning different things. This is some data from my lab showing um, essentially that when in either a control or blast animal, when the, the blast animals have essentially a shift from when they're either in a neutral chamber or when they're in that 
um, blast paired chamber, again, suggesting that there's something uh, meaningful in these vocalizations. And then finally, this is data from Ben's lab with the, the um, neuropathic pain, again, showing that pre-pain uh, model, they don't show very many vocalizations, and then you get this big increase after you induce this um, sciatic nerve ligation. Uh, this is a pretty cool study, actually. He's using cannabinoids to try to treat this chronic pain, um, and you can see that they both decrease the number of, of these negative USVs. Okay, so where we're at basically is that there's two options for how you can analyze these USVs. The first is manual USV analysis, and so this is super subjective and time consuming. Um, this is a image of, so, so normally we do five to 20 minute long recordings of the animals. This is a 10 minute recording. Um, this is of a free software called Ravensoft Light, um, where essentially you can, it'll convert it into a spectrogram, and then essentially if you look at this kind of minute to or second resolution, you're not seeing anything. Um, if we zoom way, 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 way in to the millisecond, so this is like half a millisecond essentially, that, that is one of the USVs. <laughs> so these are tiny little things that occur. You can see you don't even really get a blip um, in the, the signal. Um, and so essentially what, what you do if you're manually doing this is this, this um, bar down here, I'm sitting and pressing forward like 200,000 times essentially for each file and then we have hundreds of these files. So doing it by hand is really not um, realistic. There are a variety of commercial options and MATLAB based options. Um, I've heard from some people that the commercial options actually don't work very well. Um, Part of it is that a lot of the commercial options or the MATLAB ones, they're all, they were generated in like perfect settings where they have sound attenuated type of stuff. And it's not, if someone like me who this is just going to augment or add to my research, I'm not gonna only do this. I don't have the money or the time to set up these really fancy type of um, situations. So, and then the other thing is that, as I said in the past, a lot of people have been focused more on these high frequency or positive effect calls. And to the point where a lot of times in these programs, they cut off the lower, like they start at 25 kilohertz and higher. And so if you look at here, these are the, the calls that I'm interested in for the negative affect. And you can see most of them are, are happening below 25 kilohertz. So in a lot of these, they won't even, they won't even see the type of calls that we're interested in. Um, okay. So general approach is to process the audio files. We want to do a classification um, of just USV versus not USV, and then do some visualizations. So first we are using, these are two free softwares um, to acquire, and then we're able to annotate um, the USVs in Ravensoft, um, and that will also apply a timestamp to it. Next thing we do is we want to then take these raw wave, wave files and um, process them. I should say we've, we're using kind of the general um, Python um, libraries. And so what this looks like is we have this 10 minute or 600 second um, wave file. We are creating slices that overlap slightly and so each slice is about 20 is 25 milliseconds and then we have a 10 percent overlap in case one of the slices is essentially right in the middle yeah um and then mine says eight minutes That's pretty <laughs> <terrible>. <laughs> yes okay and so <laughs> Um, essentially what, what this turns into is like 27,000 slices um, per animal or per session. Um, and so this was way too big for um, pandas in my laptop to handle. And so we are using X-Array, um, which was essentially a way to um, save these files and manipulate them as net CDFs, which has been a really um, awesome addition. And so essentially we can set up for each um, wave file, we now have still these 27,000 slices, but they are, um, we can call the coordinates are either the frequency or the time or the slice. So it's been really easy to do computations across these um, larger data sets. This is what a slice looks like essentially. And then again, each of these slices also has a timestamp. And so we're able to have a common key between the annotations and, um, Okay, so then we want to extract features, train, test, classifier. We're using scikit-learn, and then also at the end we tried some deep learning approaches or transfer learning. Um, 
and this is all in Jupyter Notebooks, and then we're using Google Colab. Um, the, these are showing the USB types and the number that we have annotated. Um, I'm going to focus on these, what they're called broadband clicks, or um, because we have the most of them. But here is an example. You can see that each of these call types are really pretty different. Um, so this is one of the kind of outstanding questions is, um, are we going to need to make a model for each of these call types, or can we have a one global model? Um, the first type of feature extraction we did was looking at a couple different um, kind of comments, um, audio signal processing features. Um, and then the other, oh, and then this is just showing that here in orange is our random noise slices, and that seems to separate from the rest of our USVs. Um, we also just looked at using the um, power spectral density, not postsynaptic density, no, power spectral dis distribution. Sorry, it's really hard for a neuroscientist to not say um, that. And so essentially this is looking again across the different USB types, um, seeing frequency and then power. And, and it looks like we're seeing different um, distributions and the noise is, is separate. So this has really turned into a big issue of a highly imbalanced classes. So on average, there's about only about 10 USVs per 10 minutes. So we get a 0.04% of slices contain a USV. Um, so this has been something that we've struggled with. So this is showing, first we're gonna look at upsampling. And so essentially what we do is we randomly select 100 noise files per sorry, 100 noise slices per file, we upsample so that our broadband clicks equal the random noises. Um, this is showing a Tisney plot of separation between the clicks and the noise. Okay, and I'm gonna go through this a little fast. But essentially, our training sets do really well. Our, so this is here on the eight features or on the PSD. Um, we also did a visualization so we can go through and look at your false negatives and false positives. Um, the issue comes is when even our test set is actually performing relatively well. The precision is where we start to see a little issues. The issue comes when, sorry, um, we start to, to take a, a, a file that has not, that is just a 26,000 slices essentially, and we get 6,000 USBs predicted, which is still a lot to go through by hand. Um, we can play with thresholding, um, and so we can get it down to essentially 20, 2,700 predicted sl USB slices. Um, but unfortunately, for both of these cases, none of the actual true USBs ended up in the yes. So switching over to the um, no, no upsampling, and instead we're, we were using weights as, you were, as the previous talk was talking about. Um, so this actually performed a lot better. Um, we ended up with only 250 USV predicted slices, and all five of the actual USVs were in the predicted set, which is yay. Um, we need to do a lot more. Um, this is the deep learning that we, or transfer learning we've been doing. The biggest issue is because we have a small data set and it does, um, it pulls in bins. It's essentially, this is really just bouncing, this validation set's bouncing all over. So some work in progress, um, dealing with these unbalanced data sets. Um, this class weights seem to be doing better. Um, we want to ex explore feature importance in the models. And then one big kind of outstanding question is this inter versus intralab differences. And so this is just an example from the deep learning um, clustering. And essentially what I think this is in these, these spectrograms are flipped upside down from the other ones you've been looking at. But essentially what I think this is is, is recordings from my lab versus recordings from Den's lab. Because the background noise, if you look here, <laughs> there is this th about 30 kilohertz, kilohertz like noise band in, in at the VA, but at UW, it's not there essentially. <laughs> and so that's a big question is, like I said, are we gonna have to do a new model for every kind of different change? Um, so yeah, thank you. Great, so we have questions for Abigail? Yeah. Right.
do you know why you it moves faster than the other. Cool. So it gets us <laughs> more consistent results. <laughs> So next, Stu. Yeah. And I'll let you give all your information. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. So um, I'm a PhD student from the biology department here. Um, and this quarter I've been working with uh, Ariel uh, to test this question of uh, which tree species make the best neighbors. Uh, so I do have an acknowledgement slide, but I actually put it at the end unlike everyone else. So I am gonna say thank you to everyone later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, first of all, so this talk is all about tree interactions. So why do we even care about tree interactions? So if we're trying to think about how forests are gonna respond to uh, climate change, um, it could be that we can just assume that all trees respond, uh, all trees' responses are a function purely of climate. And that would be really easy, right? We have like a ton of climate data, so it would be nice if we could just look at each tree individually and know what's gonna happen to it based on the climate data that we have. However, um, Obviously, not, tr not all trees are standing alone, um, so they are in what I'm going to call a neighborhood for the rest of this talk. So right here I have like this, this red circle is my focal tree, and then each of these gray circles are neighboring trees. Um, and so actually what we find is that the uh, performance of a tree is much, more, much better predicted um, as a function of climate and its neighbors that are around it. Okay, so how do we go about modeling tree interactions? Um, so uh, tree interactions are really, trees are actually pretty hard to work with for a number of reasons. So if we look at um, short-lived plant species, like you've got annual plant species that live for one year, we can plant them in different conditions with different neighbors. We can look at their uh, like fitness as we, uh, throughout their entire life cycle and then get really um, good empirical measurements of how those neighbor neighborhoods affect the, the individual plant. That doesn't work for these tree species that will live for hundreds of years, some of them up to a thousand years in this part of the world. Um, and so what we have to do instead um, is do a lot, uh, get a lot of observational data. We can't do the, this in an experimental way. We have to collect data on lots of trees growing in lots of different neighborhoods. Yeah. And so the data that we were using for this uh, project um, was collected by um, the Permanent Sample Plot Network, which is based out of the uh, Oregon State University. Um, and we we're using a subset of the plots that they have, particularly the ones that are um, at Mount Rainier National Park. So this is just a map of Mount Rainier National Park showing um, there's 15 stands on there. If you wanted to count all of them, you would find that there are 15. Um, and importantly, uh, Mount Rainier is a great place to work for um, if you want to do anything to do with variation in like environmental conditions because a huge amount of uh, there's a huge difference in elevation from just the start of the park going up the road to like uh, the visitor center. So all of these plots differ greatly in uh, lots of environmental variables that might be important. And so at each of these plots, what we have um, is we have about 40 years of data and every five years, a team has gone out there and they've measured every single tree that's above like a certain minimum uh, size uh, within the plot and then they've mapped the locations of each individual tree within the plot. So this means that for any tree, what I can do is I can say, um, so for this tree here, for example, I can tell you how much it grew in the last 40 years, and I can tell you which trees are around it, and for each of these trees, I know what species it is, I know how big it is, and obviously I can calculate the exact distance between each of those competitor trees and my focal tree. Um, and so in total, this uh, data set contains about um, 8,000 trees, uh, or, or a little more than 8,000 trees um, across 11 species, so these are all um, coniferous trees, because this is at Mount Rainier National Park. Probably all of you have been there. Um, and another thing I want to mention that's gonna be important later on is that although this seems like a really incredible and unique data set, this is actually not as unique as you might think. Um, a lot of forest management agencies collect similar data to this, so um, they, there's a lot of this data out there, basically. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, we're obviously not the first people that have thought about um, how trees interact with each other, so I'm gonna give you a bit of a summary of what other people have done in the past. And so um, at a very simple level, what you could do is you can model the growth of a tree species um, as a function of uh, the density of trees that are around it. So I'm including species and the size here just because the growth of any tree depends on what species it is and how big it is. Um, and so the only uh, inclusion of species interactions here comes from looking at the overall tree density. So here we have five trees in that neighborhood, and we could work out density from that. However, we might also want to think about which um, species each of those trees are. So the easiest way to do that is just to have a density for each of the species separately calculated within that neighborhood. And it's been shown that this does improve your um, ability to predict tree growth. Um, however, both of these approaches lose a lot of, or they ignore a lot of information which might be important. So particularly, um, if we look here, like I'm just gonna tell, pretend that these three blue circles in like area add up to the same as that big blue circle there. So in this case, we might see that um, the density of this blue species is the same in both of these, right? But obviously the neighborhood is not the same because the trees are different sizes, there's a different number of trees. We don't, um, the distances between the trees and the focal tree could be different as well. And each of those things might be important. And there's, um, a lot of people tend, would tend to think that that is important. So, um, how might we include this information? So a number of people have actually already created models that have included all this information. Um, and they all use um, this kind of complex model, uh, or it looks kind of scary maybe, but it's actually not. Um, but they all use this same, f uh, or, or a model that is of this general format. And so it's taking into account, um, each tree has like a maximum growth rate, which depends on its species. Um, and then that's multiplied by, um, all of this, which takes into account the uh, effects of all of its neighbors. And so what it's really trying to estimate is these species interaction terms, this lambda ij, which is the effect of the, neighboring, of the neighboring species on the focal species growth. And then it's taking into account the size of that competitor and its distance from the focal tree. And so um, this takes into account all the information that we might, that, we, that we have reason to think might be interesting. Um, however, this model does have a number of drawbacks. Um, so I've simplified it here, and it seems like there's just not that many parameters. There's actually quite a lot more than what you can see right here. And because there's all of those parameters, and this is um, a nonlinear model, it takes a, it, this model takes a ton of time to run because it's optimizing over many, many different parameters. And then another thing to note is that you can see that from, to get from these interaction terms down to growth, there's a lot of operations you have to perform. So that means that the, t the interaction term is not in units that make it um, easily interpretable or easily comparable even between different species, which is something as ecologists we're pretty interested in. So um, our goal was to try and make a model that does this but doesn't take forever and also comes out, uh, gives you a, a meaningful um, interaction term that actually you can just look at it and compare it to another one and it can tell you something useful. So um, how did we go about doing this? Uh, we decided to model our um, forest as a network. So, um, or uh, a, a lot of people will call this um, a, a graphical model and so uh, we have each of our trees, those are each of these circles, and then um, we're trying to estimate the weights along these lines that tell us how much this one affects this one, basically. Um, and so this is where we're putting in on each of these lines, we're putting in this as a function of the size, species, and distance of this competitor relative to the focal. And so, um, in this model, we've we've decided that each one of these lines is an is like um, an observation in the model. So you can imagine what our, um, our our design matrix would look like would be that there would be a separate row for each one of these lines, and so in each one of these lines, it tells us what the species of the competitor is, how big it is, how far away it is from the focal, um, and then uh, because we have everything in a design matrix like that, we can literally run this as a linear model which has this kind of formula here, which hopefully most of you can see. So it's just taking into account um, the species and size of the focal tree again, 
the overall tree density and then the densities of individual species. So that was like that second model that I showed you, which was taking into account those interactions a little bit. But now we just have the species and the size and the distance of each one of these competitors. And so because we can run this as a linear model, obviously it's going to run a way, way, way faster than um, what they, that other model was doing. So um, how good was this model? Uh, so to try and get an idea of whether this model was any good, we used cross-validation. So this is a diagram of one of my um, forest stands here. So um, imagine this is just a coordinate grid. I've just divided it into four, and I've taken the two opposite corners. To, and so I've thereby split every stand into um, two uh, in, in half. And so then I have two data sets. Each one has half the trees from each, uh, every stand, and each, the other one has half, the other half of the trees from every stand, too. And so what I do then is I fit the model on, I fit separate models on each half of the data, and then use them to predict the data from, that they have not seen at all. So that's a really good way to test the model because it's, it's really testing its predictive ability because it's using data it's never seen. And so using that, um, I then create a, a, an R squared value, a coefficient of determination. And so th although these coefficient of determinations might seem pretty small, uh, I'm an ecologist and this is pretty good. Um, <laughs> so uh, what you, these are the models that I've shown you before. So the very simple model where we're just including total tree density in the area. And this is a model where we include the density of um, trees uh, by of certain species. Um, and then this is our full model here. So it, it does make an improvement. It's not a huge improvement, I'll admit, but it is an improvement. So what we now would like to see is whether it, how good it is compared to that other more complex model that I said other people have used. And importantly, this on my laptop runs in 10 seconds, whereas the other one needs a supercomputer and probably still takes a lot of time. So um, it's, a little more, it's a little more practical if we want um, forest managers to be able to use it. So uh, just a very quick summary of some results. What this allows me to generate is a matrix showing the effect of each of these species. So they all have codes on there. Um, don't worry about what they necessarily mean. Um, but for each of these species, it's saying, what is the effect of this species on the growth of this species? And that's the color here. And then we have uh, going from positive to negative there to show what the effects are. And obviously, the diagonal is showing the um, effect of each species on another individual of the same species growth. So um, in answer to our very first question, uh, what is the um, best uh, neighbor? Seems like it's this one, right? <laughs> um, and this is the silver fir. And so we've uh, started talking about um, why this might be. What this, this was not necessarily like a result that we expected. Uh, so we need to think a little bit about, uh, more about this. Um, I should point out I had a very well-timed committee meeting this, uh, this Monday. So uh, my advisor and one of my committee members, who are both here, um, were able to help me interpret some of this. Um, and then an another one that I want to point out is this. Um, this is the uh, uh, yellow cedar. is actually like a not very good competitor. Um, and something I, w I think is kind of interesting is that these, uh, there's something different about this uh, yellow cedar species in that it changes, um, it changes which, uh, it changes the which fungi are in the soil around its roots in a way that it, um, people have predicted would cause it to not uh, be a very good neighbor for its own species. Like it would, pr it would reduce the growth of its own species. And there's one other species in the whole set that is of the same type, and that's this one here. And we can see that that is a very slightly negative if you look really close. <laughs> and the light, it looks like it on my screen anyway. Um, so I'm not saying everything is following this pattern, but that's a, a general reason why that doesn't surprise me too much. And then this one is uh, the Douglas fir tree here, which is negative pretty much across the board. Um, and that's actually not that surprising because um, it's kind of like it's the first tree that arrives in any new plot. So it kind of grows the tallest and then crowds everything else out. So that makes a bit of sense, too. And so um, this uh, functions that we have been creating this quarter, um, we're putting all these all together in an R package, which we're hoping to release. And so I'm just showing you a couple of uh, visualizations that you can make using this R package. Um, so this is just, um, I can create a um, contour map of this plot showing where uh, tree density is high or low. This is just overall tree density, but you could do this with um, 
any other metric that you can uh, have density that you want to calculate. And then um, I can also produce these um, interactive plots of stands where each, in this case, each of these trees, each of these circles is a tree, and each tree is colored according to uh, a continuous variable up there, which in this case is its annual growth rate. Um, and then on, for each tree, species, each tree, in, in, individual tree, I can click on it and then look at, get some information on it, as you can see there. Okay, and so the next steps uh, that we're going to take are um, we're going to first of all try and recreate our model separately for each individual tree species, um, which is good because it allows us to estimate the interactive interaction effects between species directly, which um, I didn't have time to go into detail of how we do it. Uh, in the current model, um, but it's also important because it's much more, this is the approach that was taken by others that have used that um, other model that takes a long time. Um, and then after that we're going to hopefully compare the performance of our model to um, the uh, model that takes a long time, um, and so we're going to request the code from some of those researchers uh, to try and uh, see if they'll give it to us and then we can just use that on our own data set and then see which one does better. And then finally, we're going to um, finish, uh, finish up the R package and release it. Um, OK, and then just before I finish, a few acknowledgments. So obviously, thanks to the eScience uh, incubator program. Um, this has been a really great experience. I've got a ton of work done, which would have taken me a real long time otherwise. Um, and thanks a lot to Ariel for all his help. Um, and he hasn't just helped me uh, do all this. Um, he's also taught me a whole lot at the same time. Um, and I've learned a lot of useful data science skills. Uh, and then thanks to my advisor, Janneke, for um, helping me design this whole idea for a project. Um, and thanks to my committee member, Brian, for helping me uh, interpret some of this um, data. And then finally, thanks to a ton of people who collected, obviously, all this data that um, I didn't collect. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. As so every tree that's in the data set is both a competitor and a host tree at some point. So it's just done both. Ways. So when you see like a pairwise, like one of those lines on the network that connects two trees, it's what's called a directional graph model because it's not the same in both directions, right? So it, that each line appears in two rows on our data set. Once with one of them as the local and one for the other. Uh, we definitely haven't even thought about looking at that, but um, <laughs> that would be very interesting if we could. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it provides a framework for doing all kinds of things. So it's actually, this is supposed to be like my first chapter for my uh, PhD, so um, this might help me a lot for figuring out what my third chapter will be. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of things we could do with this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. There's the title of my project. Um, we don't need to go into that. I'll try to explain it to you so it makes sense. Um, I worked with uh, Bernice this quarter. Um, she's not here. She's at a conference, um, unfortunately. And uh, so I'll go on. So you can see it. Great. I didn't send her the slides, I promised to. But uh, she'll see them eventually. So. Uh, um, my project is related to air pollution, and air pollution, I want to convince you, is bad. So I'll tell you some things about it. It's uh, estimated to cause about 4.9 million deaths annually, according to uh, a study released by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation here at the UW, um, as well as 147 million disability-adjusted life years. Um, those numbers are from 2017. The World Health Organization estimates that 91% of the world lives in places that have air pollution that's above their recommended guidelines of 10 micrograms a meter cubed of particulate matter pollution on an annual average. So on this map, that's anywhere that's not green. So 
we're lucky. We're mostly green on our map of the United States, and Washington is green. Um, those facts that I just mentioned, those mean that air pollution is the world's largest environmental health risk. It's not the largest health risk, it's environmental health risk. And environmental risks are things that we can try to control. Um, just to give you a little bit more background on air pollution, air pollution um, consists of many things. Some of them are listed here. The reason I've listed these ones here are these are the pollutants that are regulated in the U.S. under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that were established in the 1970s to help us clean up the air in the United States. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier particulate matter air pollution. That's what my research focuses on. That's what I'll talk about in terms of when I say air pollution the rest of the day. If I, that's what I'm talking about. It's particulate matter pollution. And it's the stuff that you can see in the air when it's polluted, like when we have forest fire smoke, for example. It's tiny little particles that stay, stay suspended in the air. And we're most concerned about this particular part of it called PM 2.5 because those particles we can inhale pretty deeply into our lungs. Our respiratory systems are very effective at filtering the air we breathe, fortunately, but some things do get into our lungs, and when they do get into our lungs, they can cause health effects. Um, here's some numbers. I know that if you're sitting over there, you can't see them because of the podium. Um, I learned that, but uh, um, there are um, particulate matters in, measured in micrograms per meter cubed, um, and like an eyelash weighs about 40 micrograms, say. so. That's uh, the, say the World Health Organization standard is that they want the yearly average of air you breathe to have less than 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So that's less than a, you know, a quarter of an eyelash. Of course, these particles are tiny, so you have to have a ton of them to even make up that much. Um, and just to give more background, because I think this is interesting, the US EPA established this thing called the AQI, which we've probably heard on the radio and stuff in Seattle. Um, the AQI tries to convert any air pollution. Um, here I've put up numbers for PM 2.5 and ozone into some common index here that is used to be like, OK, air quality is good, moderate, unhealthy, um, really bad, that kind of thing. Um, and just to give an idea of what this looks like, there's a nice day in Seattle where the air quality index would have been 12. And here is a picture that I took when we had that nasty smoke last summer um, where the AQI would have been 179. Um, so my work, very briefly, is related to sampling air pollution and analyzing it. So we use filters. This filter is much bigger on the screen than in real life. This is only about an inch. Um, it's a personal exposure monitoring filter take those filters and extract them into a solvent and do fluorescence spectroscopy on them. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room are familiar with fluorescence spectroscopy. It's not that important to be familiar with it, but I'll give you a tiny little introduction of what it is. You shine light on the sample and you get a signal back. The signal might look something like that. What I do is have an instrument that can shine light of different wavelengths on the sample and get a bunch of different signals back and you could combine them into a plot that might look like that but for the rest of my talk I'll represent them as a contour plot that looks something like a like a map of a mountain um, all that that matters is that it it looks a little bit like an image I guess for the rest of my talk um, I've done some work in the laboratory where I collect controlled sources of air pollution namely the ones on the screen cigarette smoke diesel exhaust and wood smoke from clean cook stoves and you can see the EEM plots of these, they all look kind of unique. So that's useful because if you can identify where air pollution comes from, you might be able to help reduce people's exposure to it. That's called, uh, that practice is called source apportionment. Helps us make, helps policymakers make decisions about how to, to regulate things. Do you need to regulate diesel trucks or do you need to regulate people burning wood in their, um, in their homes? But it's, in the real world, like, you're not gonna have just pure sources like I showed there. You're gonna have mixtures. So here's a here's a plot of a mixture. Like can anyone guess what's in there? Diesel, you think? And go back. Wood smoke. Go back. Okay. So people think definitely wood smoke, cigarette, but maybe diesel is hard to tell because it's a smaller signal. This is, if I remember correctly, um, I can't actually check this because it's just an image. I think it's an equal mixture of all three. Um, so point is, just looking at these is not going to be the way to use this. Um, needed a different approach to do this. Um, and what I was, have been doing um, with this to end up on is using convolutional neural network. Um, not going to describe how 
how that works, I'm going to assume that either you kind of know or that there's not enough time. So if you want to ask me some questions on that, I, I'm happy to answer, answer them. The reason that we use this and decided to go with this is because these things look a lot like images. And so we figured this technique that works really well for images and computer vision could be useful for us. Um, and um, one of the big things with uh, doing a neural network, and specifically a convolutional neural network, is you have to design the architecture and decide how you're going to um, try to, it's kind of like what are you trying to tell it to look for, roughly speaking, but it's hard to actually know what you're telling it to look for, and that's what uh, I'll get to later. But here's two network architectures that are used, and I don't expect you to really tell the difference between them. There's not a lot of difference between what's going on there. Um, I'll just call them one is a large first filter and one is a small first filter. So we use these on the lab data that I had and got pretty good results to perform source apportionment on data there. These are some plots that I've used like to decide how well I'm doing. They're parity plots. Of, the concentration that I measured by like weighing the filters that I collected and the concentration that the algorithm predicted and does pretty well for cigarette both of these algorithms diesel has more challenging that's the most challenging thing to detect and then the wood smoke the clean cook stoves is over there on the right both networks look pretty similar it's like so how do we decide which network is actually doing something reasonable because what I ultimately want to do is take these this uh, technique and apply it to real world samples, not these like kind of contrived lab samples. So it's important to know the network, if we're going to use a neural network, is looking at things that we expect it should. Um, so that's what I've been working on at the Data Science Incubator. Um, if you have any questions like relating to stuff that I've said so far, go ahead and ask me those now. Um, then I'll just wrap up with the stuff. So one way to look at, figure out what a neural network is looking at is called this called salience, saliency maps and what those are is you'd have like in image classification you'd be like if you have this image you would say that is your network might say come back and say that is an image of a dog and that's what the network that I ran this image through said it said it was Irish setter which is pretty close um, to the right answer um, and if you do a saliency map you can see that the network thought that the area of the image where the dog is was the important part for giving that answer. So that's good. That's a reasonable answer. In terms of the baby in the picture, this network that I was running this through didn't actually have baby as a class. The closest thing to baby was bassinet. And when you do bassinet, you can kind of see it does look at this part of the image. It also looks at the dog a little bit. But um, anyways, that's that's not my, my uh, that's just an example. Um, so does that kind of make sense what these saliency maps are doing? OK. Um, just to give you kind of an idea of how that saliency map is figured out or computed is you have an output of the network in my network that I have up here, over here, on the far side of the screen away from me, there are three outputs for the three concentrations that I was trying to predict. And you would say, if I look at this concentration and I take a derivative all the way back to each pixel in this image, how much does that change when I vary the intensity of this pixel? And we make the assumption that if it changes a lot, it's important. I mean, that's not a perfect assumption, but that's how those saliency maps are computed. So what I have here is a saliency map of that comes from the uh, first network that I showed you that had the large first filter. Um, and I'll have to take a second and kind of explain this. Um, so here is the actual spectra of cigarette. And it would make sense if the network was looking at areas where there was actually peaks. Um, so if you look down here at this saliency map, I don't know if you can see that. Everyone can see that. It's kind of like... It doesn't look very much like peaks, and it's looking over here. Um, over here, there's like is an area of an EEM spectra. If you're familiar with the EEMs, it's kind of like an area where there's noise, and there shouldn't be much information there. So, although this network was performing really quite well, it uh, doesn't seem to be looking at anything reasonable. Um, fortunately, um, this network, um, this is um, the small first filter that I. Um, mentioned, this looks at areas of the image that are a lot more reasonable. This looks at 
an area where you see that there's kind of a, a peak here. Diesel looks at an area where there's diesel peak, and wood smoke looks at an area where there's a wood smoke peak. Still not perfect, um, and I think there's some things I'm going to do to adjust how I um, pre-process my data to maybe make this look a little better and get some better results. Um, but that was that was the main thing that's worked for us um, in terms of interpreting things um, in my neural network model. We've done a few other things; those haven't been quite as successful, um, and we'll possibly continue working on those a little bit longer. Here is just. Um, for fun, oh, I got to turn the laser pointer off. A video of the network training you could see that it started out kind of noisy, and then it learns to look at areas where there's actually um, information. So, thanks again to the incubator program. I've had a great experience this quarter, um, and thanks to my advisors who neither of are able to make it. My primary advisor is on sabbatical, so that's kind of neat for him and for me. <laughs> um, and uh, thanks, I didn't put Bernice on this slide because she was on the first slide, but thanks for, to Bernice for working, me, working with me this quarter. And um, there's the funding that's related to the work I've done in, in my PhD so far. So does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Yeah. I noticed that both of your models tended to overpredict, like all three of the um, pollutants, and I, I was just curious if there was any significance to that. Um, there is, and I will go back to the slide I think you're talking about. This slide? Yeah, so, yeah, so a lot of the dots, especially I guess for the. So the reason that they would over or under predict um, is because of the way that I've created, I've simulated, I don't have a ton of data to actually train a neural network on, so I have a data augmentation scheme that uh, would take me a long time to explain thoroughly. But the upshot of it is I take a small number of samples and then use those to make a bunch more samples and train on that, which is what's shown in this kind of like blue cloud. Um, and the samples that I choose for that, if they're generally like just have more signal or less signal than the average, um, that'll tend to bias the, the network's predictions. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. I, yes. It does. Okay. So yeah. Are the spectra linearly additive? They are. Yes. Um, if these were my, I have a slide that I could show you, <laughs> but I don't have it handy. Um, if you take, I've taken, just to prove this to myself, yeah, fluorescence should be linearly additive. There are matrix effects and stuff, but I've taken, you know, an extract of one and an extract of the other, analyzed them individually, summed them up in the computer, poured them together, analyzed them, looked at the spectra, and they look almost exactly the same. They're not perfect. So. Yeah. I noticed in your spectrum graph, it seems the lower right corner always don't have any light. Is it possible to cut them off so as to help the prediction? Um, that that part of the, yes, that part of the image is like an area that you don't expect any signal, right. and that's one of the things that I have not. Um, some people just totally chop that off and zero it when they're processing these data. I have not totally zeroed it, which is one of the things I plan to go back and do because I think that yeah. I may be overfitting on that occasionally. Yeah. Um, I asked you this question at the beginning of the incubator and I'm embarrassed that I predict the answer, so I'm going to ask again. <laughs> okay. What drove you to, uh, to CNNs from using Parafac? Um, I did some initial work with Parafac and it didn't work very well for me. Okay. And I still haven't revisited it. Um, it would be interesting to revisit it on this exact same data set. I've revisited several models that are kind of like used similarly to Parafac, um, like partially squares or um, what's the other one? I'm forgetting. I've done a couple comparative models. And the neural network on this uh, lab data set that I'm talking about has outperformed them significantly. Sure. I mean, it's notoriously arcane, like Parafac is. Mm -hmm. So if you can sort of revolutionize, and I've, I just looked while you were talking, I found a couple of other people starting to do this also. Yeah. It would be really great if this kind of turned the corner and, and gave 
people working with Eames a whole new set of tools. Yeah. So, yeah, that's something I didn't mention. Hopefully, I've got a couple of students that got tied up this quarter that wanted to work on it with me, but getting some of this code like cleaned up and packaged it, it's all done in, in Python. So we're hopefully going to release something and put it in Journal of Open Source Software. That's something that the incubator has pointed me towards. So. Well, thank you to all of our participants. A really fun program. And um, we have some refreshments. Um, and you can find people and quiz them more if you want to ask your questions in a smaller setting. Thank you.